Hello there, and welcome to Shots in the Quark. In this episode, we're going to be talking a bit about antimatter. Have you ever wondered why antimatter exists? Why ordinary particles have these shadowy twins that they annihilate with on contact? Well, it turns out that there's a very good reason, but it might not be quite what you expect. It all has to do with the speed of light and a curious phenomenon known as quantum tunnelling. In order to understand why antimatter exists, we're going to need to take a look at how special relativity and quantum mechanics can be combined. So come and join me as we embark on a special quantum journey. First of all, what is antimatter? At this point, antimatter may not be all that unfamiliar to you. After all, we've known about it for nearly a century now, and it's produced during the radioactive decay of some fairly mundane elements. At CERN, we've even been able to create and store it. But if you haven't heard much about it before, antimatter is quite straightforward to describe. All of the kinds of fundamental particles that we know about have an antimatter pair. For example, the electron's antiparticle is called the positron. These antiparticles have exactly the same mass as their counterparts, but have opposite electric charge. So the electron and the positron both have the same mass, but they have opposite charge. The electron is negatively charged, whereas the positron is positively charged. The more bizarre thing about antimatter, though, is that if a particle meets its antiparticle, the two will annihilate each other in a great big burst of energy. They're quite dramatic about being near one another. That's the quick overview of what antimatter is, but it doesn't answer our main question. Why is there antimatter at all? Our story starts with a weird quantum effect called quantum tunnelling. What is quantum tunnelling? Well, in quantum mechanics, the things that you end up calculating are always probabilities. Particles don't have well-defined positions and velocities like they do in classical physics. Instead, quantum particles are described by something called a wave function. The wave function of a particle tells you the probability of measuring that particle to be in a particular location x. Take a wave function, square it, input the position you're interested in, and that tells you the probability of measuring the particle at that position x. Simple enough? Well, a classic problem in a first course in quantum mechanics is to look at a particle in a potential well. Here is our potential well, and this is the particle. The wave function of the particle in this setup looks like this. It takes a different value in each of these three regions. In many ways, this quantum potential well is just like a real life well. Let's suppose that our particle is a tennis ball, and our quantum potential well is just an ordinary well. If a tennis ball is stuck down the bottom of a well, then you expect it to stay there. If you just dropped it down there, then it may have enough energy to bounce around a bit at the bottom of the well, but it certainly doesn't have enough energy to get back up to where you dropped it from and actually escape the well. So what is the difference between our quantum potential well and an ordinary tennis ball stuck down the bottom of a well? We can understand what the particle in our quantum well does by looking at its wave function. Remember that the square of the wave function tells you the probability of finding the particle in that position. If we look at the region inside the well itself, we see that this is where most of the probability is. This is where the wave function is largest. In other words, we're much more likely to find the particle inside the well, at the bottom of the well, or maybe bouncing around a bit, than anywhere else. But now notice what the wave function looks like in a region just outside the well. Outside the well, the wave function decays exponentially. So there's a very small chance to find the particle outside the well, but small doesn't mean zero. What this tells us is that there is a chance that the particle can escape or tunnel outside of the well. This is what we call quantum tunnelling. 
In classical physics, if an object doesn't have enough energy to escape from somewhere, then it never will. But in quantum physics, a particle can tunnel out of where it's trapped into somewhere that classically it wouldn't be able to get to. We call these regions, where classically the particle would never be able to reach, classically forbidden. And inside these regions, the wave function takes a characteristic form. In classically forbidden regions, the wave function looks like an exponential decay. So, it's unlikely a particle will ever tunnel far away from the world that it's trapped in, but there is a non-zero chance it can escape from somewhere that classically it wouldn't be able to leave. But what does quantum tunneling have to do with antimatter? Well, in the 1920s we had quantum mechanics and we had general relativity, two pillars of physics that nobody really knew how to combine. To this day, we still haven't fully combined these two fields, but we at least know how to combine special relativity with quantum mechanics. This is what we call quantum field theory, and is the framework upon which all of modern particle physics is built. During the development of this theory, however, physicists had to deal with a lot of problems in combining special relativity and quantum mechanics. One of these problems will lead us to an understanding of why antimatter has to exist. You may have heard that in special relativity, no matter or information can travel faster than the speed of light. The speed of light is the absolute speed limit of our universe. To represent this fact, we can draw what's called a light cone. Let's say that at some time t, we have a particle located at a position x. The light cone for this particle looks like this. The light cone makes it clear where the particle could reach in the future and where it could have been in the past. The particle can get to anywhere inside its light cone, but it can't get outside. This is because to end up outside the light cone, the particle would have to travel faster than the speed of light. Outside the light cone is a forbidden region for the particle to be in. But hang on, we just saw in quantum mechanics that quantum particles don't obey forbidden signs. Even if a region is classically forbidden, a quantum particle has a small probability of tunneling and finding itself there anyway. It seems then that we found a big problem with combining quantum mechanics and special relativity. In special relativity, you cannot find a particle outside of its light cone. But in quantum mechanics, a particle has a small probability of tunneling into a forbidden region. Which is right? The answer is to be found in quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, instead of dealing with a wave function, we deal with something called a propagator. Instead of giving you the probability of finding a particle at a certain location, the propagator can tell you the probability for a particle to begin at a position x, move, and then end at some other position y. The propagator for a scalar particle, which is just a certain kind of particle, looks like this. Now let's say that we want to calculate the probability of a particle moving from its initial position here at x to a position y outside of its light cone. It's a bit of a pain to calculate unless you happen to know how to do complex number integration, but for our purposes we just need to know that the result looks something like this. e to the minus m y minus x, where m is the mass of the particle, y is the position outside of the light cone, and x is the initial position of the particle. From this, we can see that the probability of finding a particle outside of its light cone is exponentially decaying, which means that it's small, but non-zero. This is exactly what we saw when we looked at the quantum potential well. Classically, we have a region here that the particle is forbidden from entering, but there's a small chance that it will leak out into there anyway. Does this mean that special relativity is wrong? Do we just need to accept that there's an exponentially small chance that particles can travel faster than the speed of light? The solution to all of this turns out to be antiparticles. When we only have normal particles in our theory, there's a non-zero chance that they can travel faster than the speed of light and escape their light cone. But 
If each normal particle has a corresponding antiparticle, then it turns out that the probability of finding the particle outside of its light cone cancels with the probability of finding its antiparticle outside the light cone. So neither of them can be found outside the light cone. Let me explain. If we introduce antiparticles into our theory, it changes what the propagator looks like. Without antiparticles, our propagator looked like this. But if we include antiparticles, our propagator ends up looking like this. It now has two different terms. We can interpret one of the terms as being the probability that you find a particle traveling from x to y, and the other the probability of an antiparticle traveling from y to x. Now, if the two points x and y are both inside the light cone, then this whole expression is non-zero. This means that particles or antiparticles can travel between any two points inside their light cone as we'd expect. But if one of the points happens to be outside the light cone, then these two terms in the expression end up cancelling out perfectly, meaning that there is no chance at all for a particle or an antiparticle to travel faster than the speed of light and be found outside of the light cone. So if we introduce antiparticles into our theory, we preserve both of the lessons that we've learned from quantum mechanics and special relativity. Quantum mechanics tells us that particles have a small chance of tunneling outside of their light cone. But since antiparticles have an equal chance of being found outside their light cone, the two probabilities end up cancelling each other out, and so nothing can be found outside of its light cone as special relativity demands. The existence of antiparticles then prevents anything from just so happening to travel faster than the speed of light. One last point to mention is whether all particles do indeed have their own antiparticles. The answer is yes and no. All particles have antiparticles, but not all particles have antiparticles that are different from themselves. For example, the electron and positron are two distinct particles that are antiparticles of each other. The photon, on the other hand, which is a particle of light, ends up being its own antiparticle. A photon and an antiphoton are the same particle. So all particles have antiparticles to preserve the fact that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, but in some special cases, a particle can be its own antiparticle. So there you have it. Why must there be antiparticles? They must be there to prevent normal particles from having any chance of traveling faster than the speed of light. If there were no antiparticles, normal particles could conceivably tunnel to places that they could never have reached without breaking light speed. That kind of world would probably behave very differently to our own. So thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Please like and subscribe for more Shots in the Quark.